Welcome to Bible Talk, the midweek Bible conversation from the Alexander City Church of Christ. Thank you for joining us. Now, here are your hosts, Brendan Chance and Andy Graham. Good evening. Welcome back to Bible Talk, episode number five. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, last week, we especially appreciate the support. Took a little detour and had some uh, guests come in from the outside. We really appreciate Chris and Avery coming in. Did a great job. If you have not taken the time to uh, see the Christian response to racism episode we did last week, uh, I, I'd encourage you. I think it's beneficial. There's been a lot of people let me know that it's been a blessing to them. I think it would be to you. It's a little long, but uh, break it up. Listen to it as you drive, and I think uh, I think it'd be good. Tonight, we welcome back uh, Jared Sanders, who is our, our guest host today, our first returnee guest host, so congratulations. When Good the histories you. record, uh, Wikipedia in 2050 records the great history of Bible talk, <laughs> it'll be noted that you were the first repeat guest. I'm looking so forward to that. That's, yeah, so. that'll make you famous. Uh, and then we have Andy, as always. Tonight, we're going to go ahead and look at Genesis chapter 45, and uh, the General gist is 1 through 28, so go ahead and get there, and we're going to be looking at this topic here today. Uh, so if you've got your Bibles, go ahead and open up to those, and Andy is going to lead us in a reading. Andy, you can explain to everybody uh, how you're going to break up this reading, because it, it's a little lengthy on its own. Uh, so Andy has done some preparation to uh, kind of condense it down for our sake, for time. Yeah, just uh, to kind of, uh, for the brevity's sake, um, it, this is just the pertinent information from 1 to 15, and now I'll skip down to verse 25, which uh, gives the conclusion of it. You certainly get the gist of everything that goes on. It just um, omits some minor details that you can go back and read for yourself. So I'll begin Genesis chapter 45, beginning in verse 1. Then Joseph could not restrain himself before all those who stood by him, and he cried out, Make everyone go out from me. So no one stood with him while Joseph made himself known to his brothers. And he wept aloud, and the Egyptians and the house of Pharaoh heard it. Then Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Does my father still live? But his brothers could not answer him, for they were dismayed in his presence. And Joseph said to his brothers, Please come near to me. So they came near then he said, I am, your, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. But now do not therefore be grieved or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. For these two years the famine has been in the land, and there are still five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvesting. And God sent me before you to preserve a posterity for you in the earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So now it was not you who sent me here, but God. And he has made me a father to Pharaoh and lord of all his house and a ruler throughout all the land of Egypt. Hurry and go up to my father and say to him, Thus says your son Joseph, God has made me Lord of all Egypt. Come down to me, do not tarry. You shall dwell in the land of Goshen, and you shall be near to me, you and your children, your children's children, your flocks and your herds, and all that you have. There I will provide for you, lest you and your household, and all that you have come to poverty. For there are still five years of famine. And behold, your eyes and the eyes of my brother Benjamin see that it is my mouth that speaks to you. So you shall tell my father of all my glory in Egypt and of all that you have seen, and you shall hurry and bring my father down here. Then he fell on his brother Benjamin's neck and wept, and Benjamin wept on his neck. Moreover, he kissed all his brothers and wept over them. And all that his brothers talked with him. Now I'll skip down to verse 25. Then they went up out of Egypt and came to the land of Canaan to Jacob their father. And they told him, saying, Joseph is still alive. 
and he is governor over all the land of Egypt. And Jacob's heart stood still, because he did not believe them. But when they told him all the words which Joseph had said to them, and when he saw the carts which Joseph had sent to carry him, the spirit of Jacob their father revived. Then Israel said, It is enough. Joseph, my son, is still alive. I will go and see him before I die. Thank you. All right, as, uh, as we're in this world with a lot of uh, troubled times around us that we live in, uh, this seems to be a, a story that is timeless. It is not just a story, but an account that is timeless. Uh, we see an extreme level of humbleness, forgiveness, grace, and mercy in, in the case of Joseph. In case you didn't know, his, his brothers had faked his murder, had sold him into slavery, and now Joseph's one of the most powerful men in the world, and he could have rained down justice upon them and had every, had every right to. Uh, but yet he chooses to show forgiveness so we want to talk about that tonight and to guide our conversation and to, to kind of keep us in a lane. Where traditionally, we ask a few questions, and our guest host is the one who, who praises those to us. And so, Jared, uh, if you would, uh, go ahead and get us going in our talk tonight. Um, yes, uh, the first question is, what, what do we learn from God in, from this passage? What do we know about God from this passage? Okay, well, what do we learn about God? Um, Andy, why don't you take a shot at it first? What do you see about God in this? Well, I think um, you kind of probably have to um, step back and, and realize some things about the story to kind of get the to kind of get the big picture of what exactly is going on. Um, obviously, you know, I, I, most people already know this, but for anybody that doesn't, um, we're seeing here a fulfillment of a promise to Abraham. Uh, God told Abraham, "I'm going to make a great nation out of your seed." Abraham had Isaac. Isaac had Jacob. Jacob had 12 sons. Those 12 sons become the 12 tribes of Israel, the great nation of Israel. So, uh, number one, when I see this story and I see the, the culmination of this odyssey from Joseph in uh, Genesis 45, I see that um, God Almighty is the greatest chess grandmaster ever mm -hmm. he is you know chess is a game where you're moving different pieces around you're uh, they're moving in different directions uh, you're, you're establishing strategies and plans and trying to execute them to ultimately bring forth a desired result and you see God here and Joseph makes so you know throughout this uh, chapter 45 he makes it clear. He says, look, I mean, basically, you meant this for evil. Yeah. Well, you sold me into slavery, but God meant it for good. Right. He said, you didn't send me here. You did not send me to Egypt. God did. So God is, I mean, the, the, the pieces and the world that he, he's using people, he's using individuals, he's using, you know, good, he's using evil, he's using sin, he's using... Good decisions, bad decisions, people that want to be used, people that don't want to be used, and it's all working out for an individual in Joseph. It's all working out for a nation in Israel. I mean, it, it, it's just, you hear often somebody say, uh, you know, uh, everything happens for a reason. Mm -hmm. And then you hear somebody else say, well, you know, you know, the world, you know, God, we, we are free moral agents. We're making our own decisions. And, and basically, you know, the decisions I make determine the course of my life. Everything in this story happens for a reason. And that's kind of you step back and think how unbelievable that is and how masterfully and how powerful God is. And I'm pretty much in awe of it. That was a lot. I'm sorry. Yeah, it's okay. Um, you know, I, I do think I'm going to kick it to Jared. Remember in our discussion, with the, with the exception of a, a last week's detour, uh, we've been looking at these biblical accounts in the scope in regards to uh, relationships and, and even not just family dynamic but in the family but all relationships and this is a family falling out and it doesn't get much worse than the family falling out we see here and so we see a way uh, that that this can go that's not detrimental that doesn't further the damage I, I'd like to go on a little bit more what Andy had to say but before I do that I'll give Jared 
what, what are your shot? What are your thoughts? You raised the question. Um, how, how do we see God? What do we learn about God in this passage? What, what did you take away? Um, I think Andy made some really good points in there, but in, in there, and I, I think I, what hangs out to me is that how willing that even though Joseph is always understanding of what God's doing to him, he, he understands that. That's more, I guess, gets into what we'll talk about a little later too. But but God God has a plan, and if the, if you're willing. For God to let, allow God to mold you and to use you, you can fit into His plan, and He can use you no matter what kind of circumstance happens. And there's a lot of bad, horrible circumstances around Joseph that He uses to to do that, uh, to get to get the uh, Jacob and his family there. Uh, is really, I think, uh, the ultimate goal. And you know, as you go forward, and we we see Moses and the great works that God does in Egypt, and and those things to prove that to show that He is God. And how, how he uses and moves those things, I, I think that's the overall thing you understand about God that he is he is able to do whatever he sets his mind for. Uh, the fancy word for what we talk about is providence, God's providence, and uh, I, I love that verse. It says, "For you, you meant it evil for me." Andy, that's in Genesis fifty. Uh, you meant it evil for me, but God meant it for good. Joseph, I, in talking to his brothers. While he is forgiving and merciful, he, he doesn't let him off the hook. Many times when we have problems with people, especially people with family, we we either bring it up and hit them over the head, hit them over the head, hit them over the head, or we act like it never happened. Now, that's kind of how people deal with it. Joseph does neither. And he doesn't hit him over the head with it, but he doesn't act like it never happened. He he mentions it, and Andy read in verse 5, and uh, well, excuse me, in verse 5, he says, and now do not be distressed or angry with, with yourselves because you sold me here. You sold me here. This is on you. I, we're not letting you off here. And God, and then verse 7, he says, and God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant on earth to keep you alive for many survivors. So it was not you who sent me here, but God. And he's, what he's trying to say is it's all God's will. And God can use evil things that happen for good. I mean, we see that. We see that going on right now. I mean, we, and through all the tumult in our world right now, there's still, once a day, it seems like one instance of good I hear. You know, I, today I had a brother messaging lengthy things about a conversation that he's having with the preacher, trying to help him see a different side to a subject and having conversations that wouldn't have been had a month ago. Uh, and so God can use evil situations for good. He keeps coming back to that. He keeps, Joseph keeps coming back to God's plan, God's work. Now, it's one thing to understand. God didn't cause all these troubles. God didn't cause uh, his brothers to sin. God didn't cause Potiphar's, Potiphar's wife to sin. God didn't cause the cupbearer bearer to do what he did. However, we're all reminded that God takes this, these situations and he works. And if you would all look into our own lives... We can probably find a moment when someone had done us wrong or something somebody intended to hurt us, and we wouldn't be the people that we are today without that instance. And that's God doing the same thing in our lives through his providence that he does for Joseph. And I'll be quiet for a minute here after this, and we put it to the New Testament. And the New Testament has a verse that sounds very clear, a uh, very clear uh, correlation to this. Romans 8, 28. For we know that all the things work for good for those who love the Lord and call according to his purpose. Very clear. Joseph falls under that category for somebody who loves the Lord and calls according to his purpose. And lo and behold, what happens? God works it out for good in his life. Do you have any more thoughts on where we see God in this? I have a lot. I have a lot more about people, to be honest. Okay. Uh, but do y'all have any more thoughts of, of seeing God in this? Uh, just, I mean, obviously just seeing um, uh, the way that, and to echo what Jared was saying, that, you know, if you trust in God, especially, especially in the times when it appears that he has abandoned you. Joseph sold in slavery by his own family. He rises up to a level, okay, I, I've worked hard. I get to a level, oh, you know, I'm unjustly accused of a crime I did not commit. I'm in prison. I have an opportunity to interpret a dream. 
All you got, I'm all I'm asking is for you to remember me. And uh, yeah, okay. I mean, seven, eight. How many? How many years later? Mm -hmm. You know, years later, he remember. It seems like if 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 I, you know if Joseph was just any other person, you could say, well, you know, he you know he he would forgive. But if we'll trust in, in God always, as Jared was saying, you know, is in control, and He always keeps His promises, and He's always going to seek your good, your best, um, the best outcome for you, if you'll just trust Him. Right. And that that that's something to remember about God is you know. It might seem at times that things are dark, but God is God is working, and you see again all these different ways that He's He's utilizing things to in your path to to get you to a certain place. And you know, if Joseph says basically, look, the twelve the twelve tribes wouldn't exist. You would have died. You would have started. This, this is it. This is it. This yeah. this, this is it. This is how yeah. we survive. And there's going to be a great and nation there too. Me, yeah, you know, to get there. And, and so maybe the application there for you is you don't know why you're in the circumstances you're in life right now. Maybe your pit is right now. Maybe you're in the pit right now and somebody hurts you and did evil by you and they're wrong as can be. Give God a chance to work that good out. Give God, let your faith get stretched a little bit and give God a chance to work it out. Jerry, what's your next question? Um... And the, from these, this passage, what do you see about, what do you learn about people and their relationship with God, I think, is important too. Well, one thing that I saw was kind of a, kind of a, maybe probably not, maybe not what you saw is, um, trying to look at something kind of outside the box like I usually do, is people need to be shocked to change in many cases. And that is not a new phenomenon. Uh, there has to be a jolt of some type. What are we talking about? Well, in this passage, the when when they meet when they meet Joseph again, uh, let's see up in verse. Let's see, I'm sorry, uh, verse four. Come near to me, and they came near to him. He said, "I'm your brother Joseph. Do not be distressed or angry." Um, if you look around that area, I'm missing the exact verse. It's between one and four there. Um, they step back when they realize this. They're shocked. They can't talk. They can't speak. There's actually a Jewish folk tale that goes along with that, that that gives the idea that there's this is not biblical truth, but it's a Jewish folk tale that their souls left out of their body and they were so afraid and so and so shocked. But it changes them. That shock changes them. They realize their sin. It confronts them. It's it's named to them. It is con they can't avoid it any longer. They're going to have to confess it to their father. It's it's there in plain sight for the whole world to see. And it changes them. I see a parallel to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, when a, when a group of predominantly, once again, Jewish men are in the audience. There's others there, but we know there's a lot of Jewish men in that audience. And their sin is named to them. And they're confronted with it. And they know at that point in time, they have to, they have to admit it, and they have to change. And we see a change. And so one thing I, I see about people, I didn't necessarily learn it, learn it is it's a reminder that when shocking things happen, sometimes we need shocking events to happen in our lives to, to be snapped out of it to truly change. Guys, your turn. Go ahead, Jerry. Uh, well, I, I think when you're faced with something that, like Joseph did several times throughout his life, thrown in, uh, sold into slavery, thrown into prison, uh, you, you react one way, you either fight your way out of it or you kind of cower and back down and kind of give up. And Joseph really doesn't do either one, and and, that, and I think that's kind of a rare situation. That's how he doesn't react either way. He just okay, this is where I'm at. I'm gonna work my way out of it. And then it, it seems that God has put me here for a reason. He always has an understanding of that. That's beyond most of us. Um, but he but and God continues to bless his hand no matter what circumstances he, he's in. He's in Potiphar's house and both in prison and. Uh, and, every, and God continues to bless him. So Joseph kind of overcomes his situation and doesn't complain about it, doesn't cower to it, and doesn't show any resentment to the people that put him in that situation because it wasn't his, ever his fault. You know, I see Joseph here, and I see the way that he treats his brothers. Um, you know, he, he's, I mean, he weeps. And not because... 
you know, he's sad. He's he's happy to see them. He's he's able to forgive them for what they've done. Um, he's able to release that. I mean, he, he falls on Benjamin's neck. He falls on his brother's neck. They they embrace. They're you know they're weeping. All of them are weeping. He see and and you know I think about I guess families today. I mean, blood relatives are torn asunder over a thousand dollars. I mean, oh, oh, pick. I mean, what over a family heirloom over. Anything. I mean, so, so so and so didn't send me a card on my birthday. You know, families are literally torn apart over some of the. And I sit there and I think about Joseph, and I've heard this story a million times. But when you really step back and you read it and you start thinking about it, his own family sold him into slavery, slavery, mm-hmm. and he's sitting there now. Granted, it took him a while, and I'm sure he was mad about it, but he got to the point to where he was mature enough. And he said, and I, I'll go back to what you said and read it. And you read it one way, and I kind of read it another. You know, he said, don't don't beat yourself up about it. Don't be angry with yourselves. Don't be dismayed. He said, look, I can, I see it now. I'm here, I'm, I was here to save your lives. You did it, you, know, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. And he's, he's mature enough to actually... Uh, see the will of God in action, and that allows him to be forgiving. Yeah. That allows him to be a forgiving person. And, and could could I could I forgive my brother and sister for selling me, uh, you know, in the, out of the family? Yeah. I mean, yeah, it'd be tough. Uh, it'd be tough. But man, I mean, if I could get to the place that Joseph is, that's a real guy. It's a real situation. Yeah. It's a real life story, yeah. and he was able to do it. And I'm, I mean, wow. He's you and me. He's got yeah. he's, he's his superpower. I mean, uh-huh. he's, he's just a guy. And yet he gets to this point where he's he's this Christ-like. Really, that's I don't know there's a better way to describe it. He's that Christ-like. I mean, you think about the extreme examples of forgiveness in the Bible or in, in the history of humanity. Uh, you got Jesus on the cross, and you know, honestly, not too far down the ladder from that is this, where. You know, that level of wrong is being done or has been done to somebody, and they turn around and say, well, I forgive you. I forgive you. Um, something else I'm talking about about people is the influence here, and it's in the, the portion there where Andy had to admit for a length of time, is Pharaoh chimes in uh, in the middle there. And he sends assistance to the Israelites. And much like the uh, United States would send aid to a country that's had a disaster, the same thing is done here, really. I, I don't know. I, I don't know what it is on the ulterior motives or, or what. I kind of like to think that Joseph's example affected that decision. That because this was about Joseph and his people, he jumped on board with it without without maybe the reservations that you may have in otherwise. And so uh, I thought that was interesting, that through living a forgiving, merciful life, and I'm sure Joseph had to go to now say, Pharaoh, my brothers are here. And, oh, that's great. Well, let me tell you a little about it, you know. Um, and we can influence others. We can influence others. And I, I know of accounts of, of people whose relatives have been murdered, and and they're and they're they're forgiving people. I've seen brothers and sisters in Christ, you know, in courtrooms and in jailhouses, forgiving the one who killed their husband, wife, uh, daughter. And that's such a challenge. But we can get to this point. That's I think that's one thing we take away. We can we can get to that point. All right. Um. What's our what's our last question? Uh, how do we apply this story to our lives? I always step on that question and get ahead. Um, it, well, that's one way I see. Uh, we can strive for an extreme level of compassion and forgiveness when we're done wrong, because we will be done wrong. And I'll, I'll, twi- I'll, I'll give a little bit of twist to it. You know, this is Joseph's family, right? This is not those people or those people or the, the enemies across the border. This was his family. And he forgives them. How many times have you heard somebody be be hurt? I'll, I'll throw it to you guys. Y'all can kind of bat it around. How many times have we heard somebody be hurt by somebody in the church and they let that be the reason they use to leave the Lord's church? Have you, we're, we've all heard that, right? Sure. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, My, yeah, go ahead. Christians can sometimes make the bad worst example. Mm-hmm. Sometimes we're brothers. brothers. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. yeah, I mean, you know, they... they, they you know, a, a brother in Christ, a sister in Christ, 
Does and, and this could go for an unbeliever. I mean, you know, they see a Christian have a certain attitude or do something, and that just well, I mean, if that's the example of a Christian, why would I want to be that? Right. So, uh, as powerful an example in a positive way as you see through Joseph, you can be you can be just as powerful. And if you don't uh, present the same Christ-like attitudes and uh, uh, and actions like Joseph did, so uh, yeah, it, it works both ways for sure. Jared. Well, I, I, what Andy, like Andy was saying, I mean, you can look. What I what I've always told people when they come to me and they say something like, "I will never be a member of the church because of so and so did this or that," and you 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 say, "Well, I say I'm not going to keep that person from keeping me from getting to heaven," and that and that's that's and Joseph kind of seemed to understand that these things all happened to him, but I'm not going to keep that. I'm not going to get this in the way with my relationship to my God. And he and he and through that example, he showed people like Pharaoh. You, uh, Brennan, to what you were saying earlier, all that we know, all that uh, Pharaoh and those people, the Egyptians knew of the Israelites were was Joseph. Was Joseph. They they didn't know another sure. another yeah. Israelite that, that they didn't have those people didn't come in contact with them at that point in time. Uh, but but so his through his example, and they and you know they were kind of in in that passage. You see, they're kind of happy that his family's there. They're even the servants of Pharaoh. And Pharaoh himself is, is happy they're there. So jo- Joseph influences them greatly, and through his, the way he conducts himself, he's an example of how we should be. And that that's that's kind of what I take away from this. Understanding that number one, I needed I had a teacher in high school that always would say, uh, you need to understand the forest for the trees. And you know, you get lost and you get mi- microscopic and you're looking at something and you miss the big picture. Well, Joseph didn't miss that big picture. And, and through our lives, we'll, we may be stumbling over something now, and we don't understand why, but there's a reason, there's a bigger picture, and it's about where we're going, not where we're at right now. Well, let me just uh, close by saying, open your eyes and open your heart. And, you know, Joseph was a guy that trusted in God. Um, and again, things, bad things, Seemingly bad things just kept happening in succession. I mean, he I, at some point he had to feel like the most unluckiest guy on the planet, and yet he maintained his faith. He maintained his his vision, and he was able to see ultimately a pattern developing. Say, God is leading me somewhere. God, God has me where I want to be, or not where necessarily I want to be, where He wants me to be. And it is going to work out ultimately, and I believe that. And that's not easy to do all the time, and it's not meant to be easy to do. But I think that's that's the thing that I think we can put into practice. Just remember to open your eyes. You can see the will of God. Um, it, it may not always be clear at the time, but ultimately, you know, you're going to be able to see um, something happen. We'll talk about one more person who we, we in this passage we have not mentioned yet. And we'll close it up for tonight. Jacob. Poor old Jacob. He is told Joseph is dead and he, and he believes it. Why would he not him? believe it? Yeah. And then he's told Joseph is alive. But he doesn't believe it. Doesn't believe that. But then he's told. Well, the same people told him the same. Right. Thing. So, I mean, why would he believe it? And then he's told uh, to the words of Joseph. And then he's shown the blessings that are flowing through the works of Joseph. And then he believes. It's just like that for us. The only way people will know Jesus is not dead and alive is if we tell them and we show them. So my challenge for you is to maybe tell and show somebody what you have learned from this passage tonight. You can do a little bit of that by clicking that share button, but there's there's more to be done. But that does help. You never know who this might reach who needs to hear about how they can get out of the pit of the life uh, of their life that they're in. We thank you for tuning in tonight to Bible Talk, and we hope to see you again, if not in person, on Sunday, online on Wednesday. Once again, have a good evening. Thank you again for tuning in to Bible Talk tonight. Uh, We hope you enjoyed our show. And once again, if you have any suggestions or topics you'd like for us to talk about, we would love to do that.
just just let us know. Uh, in way of our announcements and, and reminders tonight, uh, keep uh, remembering that we have the Christian response to racism. If you didn't get a chance to watch that, uh, if we know somebody who does not have an online access who you think may like that, we'll make them a DVD. And so just let us know, and we'll try to get them a DVD to the Christian response to racism. Once again, thank you for the support in that difficult conversation. We are going to try to do the shoeboxes to Panama again. That's the work that we support. They're counting on us. We're going to do the best that we can with it. Uh, it's going to begin in a couple weeks, so kind of get your mind around that. We'll try to come up with a system that uh, that is uh, conducive to our environment. We're not allowed to pass things out, so you may have to just come and get those. But we'll have more about that in a few weeks. But just a heads up, shoeboxes to Panama right around the corner. Don't forget Father's Day is coming up on Sunday. We'd love to see you on Sunday as we'll look at a sermon that is tied to Father's Day and uh, we'll hopefully provide a, a safe environment uh, for you to worship in. If that's not something that you're comfortable with, please continue to do online, but we'd love to have you if you can make it. In regards to our things to be praying about, Danny, Danny Rooks is doing a lot better. I talked to uh, Nancy today and she says that he's improving and has, a, has some way to go, but he's doing some better. Ronnie Powell had a good report on his heart cast, and so we're, we give God praise for that. We're glad to hear that. Cora Tankersley has just been dealing with a lot of health issues over the last few months. Continue to pray for her, as hopefully this medicine will prevent her from needing any surgery. Uh, we continue to remember our health care workers, our first responders, uh, COVID-19, our nation, our world, our, our leaders, as there's much to pray for in regards to what's going on right now. Our long-term list, don't forget about Ricky and don't forget about all those on our shut-in list as they need our prayers too. Dan Forbes, Louise Smith, Lorraine Tidwell, Gerald Vickers, uh, much to pray for. Thank you for tuning in tonight. I hope you have a great evening.